Just give God just a hand clap of praise this morning. You know, our church, we really believe in exalting Christ and music and, and word and, our, and with our lifestyle, too. Um, we're, when people ask us, well, what, what kind of church are you? I said, well, we're, we're a Christ-centered church. We're centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ, just like that song said, you know. It talks about the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus, and that's what we're centered around. Is that everything we do is revolved around that story? You know, we're not only a church that comes in, and we don't want to be a church that comes in and just seats and receive or soaks in and receives. But we also go out. You know, we're very evangelistic. We go out, we do outreach, we share this message with the world because we believe that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've given your life to Christ, that Christ has also He wants to use you to change the world. I believe that's the second part of, of Christianity that we're missing in our day is the fact that God not only saves us, we only receive that salvation, but He calls us to change the world. He calls us to go out and actually make an impact on our society and our communities and wherever we live, wherever we work, that we want to train people up, not only that they come and and they benefit from the ministries of the church, but they also are they are part of the body of Christ. They're the hands and feet of Jesus. They go out and they're salt and light in the world. That God is actually using them in their area of influence. Um, and we're so glad you're here. That's what we're a part of. That, that's what we're about. And today, uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. You can turn there. That's where we're going to be today. We're going to start in chapter 1. Um, one uh, core action uh, of our church, one, there's, there's seven... Uh, core actions that we are that we commit to that we're all about evangelism things like discipleship uh, you know baptism we participate in evangel- in all these things one thing is the word of God is we preach and teach the word of God we teach the Bible um, I found out in my own life or my personal life and I'll tell you more about my personal testimony in a moment but I found out that the word of God even though it was written thousands of years ago rings loud and applies to our life today. Um, here at this church, we believe that the Bible is inerrant, infall- infallible, inspired. It's without area, er- error, area. See, I'm from Louisiana, so if I talk a little funny, that's why I still have that accent going on. But it's, it's without, uh, it's without error. Uh, it, it's, it's perfect, infallible. It's God's word. Uh, God wrote it. He, he, he wrote it through man. It says the Holy Spirit inspired the writers, of, writers of Scripture. So if this word speaks loud and clear to us today, and it has so far far more things to say about our lives than I that I can come up with on my own. Um, so that's what we're going to get. We're going to preach and teach the Bible here at this church. Um, and the Word of God, you'll find out that it just speaks. Just, it says it, it says it, the Bible says about itself, it says that it's living and that it's powerful, that it's sharper than a double-edged sword. That it just pierces deep down into your heart and soul and just shows you uh, where you're at with God in a good way. And... Um, so we're going to start in the Gospel of John, and we're going to start with a series of messages called Believe. Uh, believe, do we really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he, he, he's going to do and what he's done, what he said he's going to do? Do we believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Because if we really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and that should change the way we live our lives, that belief is more than just mental assent, and it's more than just believing uh, mental facts. Believing is, when you really believe in something, it changes the way your attitude towards that thing or person you believe in. It changes the way that you live, and that's what the Gospel of John is all about. It's all about believing. Do we really believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? He's the Son of God. And if we really believe Him, then that's going to change the way that we live our lives. So I sometimes get a little excited, so I don't want to knock down the microphone, so I'm going to move up a little bit. Um, But... We're going to go on and start in the Gospel of John, and the title of today's message is, is Being Christ-Centered in a Me-Centered Culture. Um, you go to a lot of churches, and you'll find it's all about us and, and you know, in our lives, but really what Christianity is about is what Jesus is doing, who Jesus is, and what He's doing, and how our lives fit into that and revolve around that. So we're going to start in the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John was written by a guy named John, as you can see. An apostle of Jesus Christ, one of the ones that was closest to Jesus. Um, he's, he was an eyewitness of Christ. So what better evidence that you have than being an eyewitness, right? The eyewitness of Christ, he was there at the crucifixion, saw him after he was raised from the dead, 
So he writes this gospel, and in chapter 20 he says, The reason why I wrote the gospel of John is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and believing that Jesus is the Son of God, you may have life in his name. So he had been impacted by Christ, he had seen Christ with his own eyes, he had followed Christ for three years, and he just had this desire in his heart that the whole world would come to know Jesus. And that is my heart as a pastor. I want people uh, to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, not only to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, but I want pe- to see people make an impact for Jesus, to train them up if they're Bible studies or small groups or doing life together, and then sending them out so they can impact the world. So we're going to be in John chapter 1. It says in verse 1, we're just going to start there. It says, In the beginning uh, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, and without Him, not anything was made that was made. In Him was life, and the light was the light of men. And it says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So we're going to start right there. We're just going to kind of go through the passage, and there's several things I want to say about Christ through this passage. But you see John starts out basically with the gospel message. You know, which is what we're sitting around, the story of Jesus Christ. And he says, this is who Jesus is. This is who he is. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He said Jesus was there before anything ever existed. He was always there. He wasn't some idea that God had, but Jesus, in the beginning, he was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is God. He is the supreme ruler of all the universe. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is it. He is the source. He is your the, your reason for existence. That's the first thing I want to say. Jesus is the reason for your existence. It says in the beginning was the Word, which means He is how God communicates to us who He is. You know, in, in this age, we're all about different kinds of communications, right? We value communication. We used to have, you know, they used to do telegraphs. And then they went to what? And went to eventually telephones were created. Now we have cell phones. Now we have iPhones and iPads and the Internet and all these different forms of communication. Because we as humans, we value communication, don't we? Communicate with each other. Communicate to the world. And guess what? God also values communication. Because ultimately how he communicated to us is through Jesus Christ. He says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, when your cell phone lights up with a text message, you're, you're going to want to look at it, right? You see, now I was, we were dropped down the freeway the other day, and it really scared me because this guy next to us was just, he was in his phone, he was texting like 100 miles an hour. I, was, you know, I told Rachel, who's my wife, who, who led the worship today, and was sitting on the back row there, I said, Rachel... I said, oh, we got, we got to get as far away from this guy. we got to get over another lane. He's about to wreck somebody. He's just sitting there just texting. I mean, we value communication, but the ultimate text message that we receive is from God, the creator of the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who created us and put us here on this earth. Jesus created you. are not an accident. He created you. But he put you here on this earth. You, you didn't come from a monkey. You're not a monkey. You're not an accident. You're not a result of some cosmic explosion. But God put you here. But before you were here, Jesus was here. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And in verse 3 it says, All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. All things were made through Him. You were made for Jesus Christ. Now you'll see something in this passage that we all, as humans, we all strive and we all seek for as well. Joy, satisfaction, fulfillment, happiness, companionship. We all desire those things, right? We all seek those things. God created us to want those things. And we were made to find all that in Jesus before we find it in anything else. Joy, satisfaction, fulfillment. That's what the whole world seeks after. And it says, without Him not anything was made that was made. In Him was, what? watch what it says, in Him was life. And the life was what? The light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. So it says, in Jesus' life, He is the source of our true joy, our satisfaction, our life, everything that we seek at. Seek at. Jesus is the life. He, he's the one that gives us life. So if Jesus is life, if we don't have Him, where are we? We're dead. The Bible says that without Christ, 
being the center of our lives without, Christ, without us having a relationship with Christ, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. He is the one that holds life. He is the source of our joy. Jesus is the source of our life. And it says the light was the light of men. And the light, notice what it says. It says light and darkness and darkness. The darkness it shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not done what? It has not overcome it. So we have light and we have darkness. And now we know that's attributed to good and evil. Everything that's good and righteousness is attributed to Jesus Christ. Everything that's dark is attributed to evil. So we know that there's, there's bro- if we look in the world, that there's brokenness, right? There's brokenness, there's, there's sin, there's evil, there's, there's, there's murder, there's, there's lust, there's all these negative things that are going on in our world. We see that our world is broken and wrecked by sin. So here's the story that John wants to communicate is, is that Jesus made the world, we broke it, and he's going to fix it. And he is fixing it. That's what this whole passage is centered around. Jesus made the world, and he saw that it was good. He created us for, for not only for his glory, but for we are created to find joy and satisfaction to him. The world was perfect, but guess what? We turned our backs on God. We, turn, we decided to go our own way, as the Bible said. Everybody has sinned. It says everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. We turned our back on Him. And therefore, darkness, sin, rebellion, disease, evil, every kind of negative thing that we see in our culture, we can think about, came into the world as what? As a result of our sin. We're fallen. And that's, that's why it says Jesus is the light, and the light, light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. That without Jesus, that the world with the absence of Jesus is dark. We see a lot of darkness, but we also, in the world, we see a lot of light, and that's because of what Jesus has done. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus is the light. We we have a lot of, we have, it seems like we have reasons to be discouraged today and to be depressed because of all the what? Darkness in the world. We're worried about what's going to happen next. We're worried about what Iran's going to do and what North Korea's going to do and what's going to happen with our economy. We have a wrecked, broken world. There's disease and there's poverty and hunger and a lot of things going on, but the good news is, is that Jesus is the light, and He shines in the darkness. And that if, when we give our life to Jesus, His light, it says the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glorious light of the gospel, it says it shines into our dark lives. You know what? And that's why I'm here today. It's because when I was 12 years old, I had my own goals. I had my back turned towards God, even though I grew up in church. I, I, I lived a rebellious and sinful life. And then one day in my living room, I had an encounter with Christ. It absolutely changed my life. Jesus' light shone into my dark life, and my life was changed forever. And we see that the light is more powerful than the darkness, but watch what it says in verse 6. He kind of switches us up here. He says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. It says he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light that came to bear witness about the light. So he says, here's Jesus, but here's this guy named John. This guy John comes, he's born into the world, and he comes and he says he's not the light, but he comes to bear witness about the light. We see that, you know, Jesus made the world, we broke it, but he has a restoration plan to fix it. He has a rescue plan to fix it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then there was this man that was sent by God. He came to bear witness about the light. That Jesus has a plan to fix the world, but guess what? He uses people in his plan. And that's why the body of Christ exists. That's why we have churches being planted like this new one that was that was just planted. This is the first day we've held a, a worship gathering together. But this is why this church is in this community. It's because we're a witness to the light. That there, if you look out here, this is a really nice community. This is a really nice, family-oriented community, but there's darkness in this community. You know why there's darkness in this community? Because there's people that don't know Jesus Christ. There's thousands and thousands of people that live in this community, and there's thousands and thousands of more that are going to move in because this is a growing area. It's going, to, it's going to grow. Businesses are going up. Houses are going up down the road. And one day it'll probably be a city like Dallas. As it grows and grows, and people from all over the world, the United States, have moved here, but there's darkness here because there's people that are here that don't know Jesus, and we're the light. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are the light. And he uses people in his plan. Watch what it says in verse 9. It says, The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. 
who were born not of, of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says this is based around that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came down into the world. It says he's the true light. And it's, you know what? He should have destroyed the world. It, 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 he would have been just in doing that. Because if he made the world, and we broke the world, then it would have been right for him as a judge to do what? To destroy the world. We all deserve God's judgment. We all, you know, it says every person is appointed to die once, and after that, they must face the judgment. But instead of Jesus destroying the world, it says he came down into the world to enlighten everyone. Isn't that amazing? That God so loved the world so much that he came down into the world. He took a big mission trip 2,000 years ago and came down into the world. And it says the world was made through him, but guess what? The world did not know him. And it says he came to his own people 2,000 years ago, and his own people did what? They did not receive him. They rejected him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them a right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So Jesus came down into the world. Watch what it says. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says, We have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus came down into the world and says, What what do we do? We rejected Him. What do we do? We crucified Him. Jesus was crucified on the cross for our sins. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was stripped. He took on flesh, but it says He was arrested, stripped naked, beaten until no skin was left on His body, literally until His own mother couldn't recognize, and He was hung up on a cross. And it says as Jesus was hanging on the cross when He died for the whole world that God took off His wrath that should have been poured out on us and poured it out on Jesus. He came to His own, but His own people did not receive Him, and they were, we rejected Him. But that was in God's plan for us to reject Him because God paid, made the payment for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. He, he died on the cross, and now all people have the right to do what? Who believe in His name to become children of God. Who were born. Not of, what does that mean? Not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. He gives opportunity right now. You know the reason why this world is still going? Why it's still in orbit? Why it's still rotating? Why we still have life and we still have breath? Why Jesus, everybody asks the question, well, we know the world's going to end. We know it's decaying. When is the end going to come? And nobody knows that but God. But he's given us this space and time to live for people's lives to be changed, for people to become children of God. There's a phrase, somebody says, everyone's a child of God. That's not true. Not everybody's a child of God, but everybody has a chance to become a child of God. It says to everyone who believes in His name, it says everyone who receives Jesus has the right to become children of God. Isn't that amazing? That if you're here today and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a child of God. It says in 1 John chapter 3, it says that, that uh, look what kind of love the Father has just poured out on us. Look what kind of love the Father has, has lavished us with that we should be called children of God. That, that's why we're here. is because there's people here in this community that have not yet become a child of God. And guess what? We're going to see people's lives change. You know why? Because we have the gospel. Because we have this message that we're giving. It says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, a guy named Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's the power of God to salvation for all who believe. We know that if we go out and we just speak the gospel, if we just speak Christ, speak this story, speak this message that Jesus made the world, the problem with the world is we broke it and he's fixing it, guess what? That transforms, that transforms people's lives. My life was changed because I've experienced the power of the gospel. And there's many of you in here today that have experienced the power of the gospel and it's changed your life. And now you just have this desire in your heart to do what? Just to be a part of Christ's mission. It says who were born again. It says who were born out of blood. Not not like you're naturally born, as me, but nor the will of the flesh, but of God. That means there's a chance for you. Jesus calls it being born again, but where your life can be totally turned upside down, you can be transformed through the power of the gospel. It's called being born again. God today can wipe your slate clean. He can He can take your past. And throw it as far as the east is from the west. He can forgive your sins. He can give you a new heart and a new life. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. It says people can be not born like over again, not go back into your mother's womb and be born again. That's another message, but being born of God. 
And how is that? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says this, he goes, We have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. It says in this passage that Jesus is the life, the light, and the truth. And John says, I have seen His glory. You know, John, you know, he was just a businessman. He was just a businessman like many people in this community and like some of you in this room. He was just living his life. He was working his job. He was trying to struggle and trying to survive like everybody else. And then he saw Christ's glory. And he said, my life just went to a different direction. He said, he said, it says that when Jesus came, it says that John and the, some of the disciples, they were in a boat. They were fishing. They were trying to make a living. They were trying to make money. And Jesus came by and he says, follow me. And their life was never the same again. And he says, I saw his glory. He's the most beautiful. I, I, he, I'm sure after he saw him, after he was resurrected, it was the most beautiful sight that he had ever seen in his whole life. If Jesus were to appear to us in this room, we wouldn't be like, what's up, Jesus? You're my homeboy. We would say, hey, it wouldn't be like a person like you and I. He would be the most beautiful, most glorious sight that we'd ever seen. And we all fall flat on our faces and worship towards this holy sight because Jesus, he's resurrected. He became flesh. And he dwelt among us, but he was crucified, died, buried, raised from the dead. And he says, I've seen his glory. And he's full of grace. And he's full of truth. And he said, John bore witness about him. And this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And Jesus Christ. That he is the source of our joy. He's the source of our satisfaction, our fulfillment. That, But a lot of people today in our society will give mental assent to Jesus. They'll say, yes, I believe that Jesus is all that. But if you look at their lives, and this used to be even mine. I used to use Jesus as a get out of hell free card. I used to, I used to, I said, you know what, I'm going to heaven, I'm saved. But I used to have this attitude until Christ changed me that I could go off and do whatever I want to do now. That, that it, it's, you see it a, a lot like this today. That we have Christ over here, we have our lives over here, and we live our lives over here, and then when we need Jesus, we come and kind of pull him off the shelf. And use, when I get sick, when something happens, when I need something, I ask Jesus, but other than that, he's right here. But what Christ is calling us to do through His Word is to make Him the center of our lives. Jesus and His mission, the center, and then all the other planets of our lives is orbited around that. He says, Seek first the kingdom of God and, and uh, His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You know what I find myself in life a lot of times? I'm, I'm just chasing after the things of this world. You know what I realize? I used to just, you know, I had my goals... And I had my dreams. I had the things I wanted to do. I wanted to have the, the great job and the nice car and all the things, you know, the, like the American dream preaches. Just, and you see people pursuing after those things as hard as they can, but then that Jesus is just kind of a little side item in their life. It's kind of like this. Would you, I mean, everybody likes cotton candy, right? Everybody loves cotton candy, but would you feed your kids cotton candy for dinner every night for two months? Would you do that? Your kids, well, I'm sure they would love that, but what would happen if they ate cotton candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? That's all you fed them was cotton candy. It tastes good. It's great. But they would probably, you know, get malnutrition. They'd probably develop, you know, a bad, bad case of diabetes at an early, early age. It, it would eventually kill them, even though it would taste good for a little while. They would probably enjoy it, but it would run out. Just like the last couple of weeks, my wife and I have been looking for, we just got married like four months ago, so we've been looking for a new car, and uh, not a brand new car, but like a used car. And so, uh, so we, we went, we were looking for these used cars, and we found this nice uh, Mazda car, it was a Mazda 3, and they were selling it for $4,000 less than what it was worth. Selling this car, it was nice on the inside, nice on the outside, we drove it around, it looked good, it felt good, we were getting excited about it, and then we took it to a mechanic, the mechanic looks at it and goes, this engine, you know, it's got a noise in it. What's going to happen is, is the engine's eventually going to get so bad that you're going to have to pay like $2,000 to get it fixed. So we didn't buy the car. We took it back and said, we don't want this car. Even though it looks good on the outside, it's nice. Uh, I mean, it's fun. It's a good-looking car, but eventually it's going to run out. We don't want to give ourselves anything that doesn't endure, right? We don't have any endurance to it. But that's what we do a lot with this life. We chase so hard 
after. You know, our 401ks, we want security in our finances. We chase so hard after having the best job and, and having this and having that. We get so caught up in just the circle of life that we miss what really lasts, what really endures is Jesus and his mission. You know what I found out from my own experience and the reason why I stand up here today is because I realized that Jesus Christ and his mission when I'm, was so far more satisfying. It's like this. You, when you turn your kids down, we say, no, you're going to eat some steak and you're going to eat some mashed potatoes and vegetables. You're not going to eat cotton candy. You're saying, the reason why I'm feeding you that stuff is because that stuff is going to sustain you. That's going to last. And it's eventually not going to you know, malnutrition you like cotton candy. And that's what happens when we give our life to Jesus. Jesus never runs out. He's eternal. He was there in the beginning, and He's going to be there in the end. The world started with Christ, and it's going to end with Christ. Christ is going to return, and then we have just this little life to do, make a decision for Him. It's to give our lives to Him. And you know what? We can, we can make Him the center, or we can make Him a side item and watch our life fall apart, eventually run out and not last, and watch it become broken. You know what I found out? When I put Christ in the center of my life, when I give Him my worship and my adoration, when I give Him my all and I give my praise to Him and I, and I put Him as a center, everything else seems to come fall in behind me. Yeah, when things happen, bad things happen. We have trials, but they're still in the center of Jesus. They still are part of God's plan. I don't have to run and chase all those things I know that God is going to provide them. And that's what this church is all about. We want to give, show people Jesus, His glory, and His beauty. We also want to show Him His mission, show them His mission. And that when you involve yourself in that, when you give your life to that, then you live a life that not only sustains you and satisfies you here on earth, but it satisfies for all of eternity. So that when you die one day and you stand before Jesus, as all of us will, you'll look at Him and He'll say to you, well done, and good and faithful servant. Or you'll look at Jesus one day and He'll say, you wasted it. You wasted it. You either hear one of those two words, well done, my good and faithful servant, or you wasted it. So today, that's what it's all about. That's what this church is all about. Is we want to seek after generations. We want to search God's unsearchable greatness. And we want to minister. We want to make an impact. That's what God calls us home. Bye,